Sorry. Hi, my name is Maura Hurley, the mayor for the city of Sanford. I'm here today at the Sanford Regional Technical School as the city introduces the new recycling encouragement program we like to call More in Return. First, we will have the city manager, Steve Buck, explain the costs associated with trash disposal in the city of Sanford. Next, Leo Mayhew from Eco Maine will give us a detailed recycling lesson. And finally, Steve Lazoskis from Waste Zero will introduce the waste management program known as More in Return. So sit back with your popcorn and enjoy this show. A roundtable discussion will complete the program. Thank you. So today, we're going to talk to you about Sanford Solid Waste Recycling for Savings. Currently, the City of Sanford expends about $1.6 million on environmental services that covers the disposal of what we generically call trash. Out of this $1.6 million, approximately $198,000 is in wages. The remaining costs are for facilities, processing equipment, and maintenance, contracted services such as trucking, environmental monitoring, and processing. And then we have our disposal costs, which covers municipal solid waste, or MSW, and recyclables. So the form that we're presenting here today will focus on increased savings by reductions in municipal solid waste, reductions in tipping fees, and reductions in handling and processing costs. Further savings will be produced by increasing recycling. In order to increase recycling, we're looking at a trash metering program to avoid municipal solid waste tipping fees. This is not the traditional pay-as-you-throw program that Sanford had in the past. Um, and prior to the referendum vote, which eliminated the pay-as-you-throw program, we're going to bring you a different program for your consideration. So, what's being presented this evening is the Council has negotiated a contract with a company called Waste Zero to provide public education, propose what's called the More in Return Trash Metering Program, as well as work with the City on a final program design for trash metering. The Council will receive through several public forums, actually six, uh, public input about the program as it's being presented, and we'll also work with Waste Zero and other partners on a program design uh, ultimately to be presented and accepted by the City. Uh, we also work to consider a future or ordinance to implement a trash metering and recycling ordinance for the future. So moving forward, the City is going to put forward six public forums over the next five weeks. Um, they actually, the last of the forums will conclude on March 25th of this month. In each of these forums, the More in Return program will be presented by a company called Waste Zero. The Council will receive input on the program design. And then, the week of April, starting the week of April 1st through the 12th, the Solid Waste Subcommittee will work to revise the program design dependent upon what they learn from you, the public, during these public forums. On April 16th, uh, they're proposing to have a first read in the public hearing to consider a recycling ordinance at the Council level. And then again on April 30th uh, would be a second read whereby the Council would consider possible actions on said ordinance if any. And the if any comes in that the pub if the public forums tell to the City Council that uh, trash metering is not desirable for whatever reasons, uh, then the Council may choose to not go forward with any recycling ordinance at all. So, what does all of this mean and how are the savings projected uh, for the City of Sanford? This next slide shows you a diagram of our current uh, solid waste disposal systems. Uh, you see in the, in the lower corner, on the other side of the, the page, is a trucking contract for $694,000 per year, which transports about 7,000 tons of solid waste, be it uh, municipal solid waste or recyclables. Currently, you see as the diagram flows uh, upwards, we have about 5,500 tons, or 79% of our total trash volume goes out as municipal solid waste. That municipal solid waste then progresses up to the transfer station, for which we incur about an, an additional $20,000 in trucking costs, processing and trucking that. Then, progressing across the top of the slide, we, uh, the city was able to renegotiate a contract for the MSW disposal cost, which reduced our cost by approximately $18 per ton. This $18 per ton on the 5,500 tons that we currently dispose of saves the city about $99,000. So you'll see in the center box, I'm bring, I will bring that $99,000 worth of savings down to that central box 
That amount of savings is already calculated in this year's budget as it's being presented currently. To the uh, far side of the uh, slide, you will see it says Casella MSW disposal. So we're currently at 5,500 tons. We pay $70.50 per ton, or about $387,750 per year to dispose of what we currently know as MSW. Going back down to the trucking portion, we know that currently we have a recycling rate of about 21%, which represents 1,500 tons of recyclables. And that is a single sort or single screen recyclables, and those recyclables are then transported to EcoMain, uh, who receives all of the city's recyclables. And you will note that in this slide, the cost to dispose per ton of the recyclables is zero dollars. So it costs us zero dollars per ton for every ton that we take to EcoMain. So in this year's budget, you will see that we currently are disposing of 1,500 tons of, of, of recyclables. We're avoiding paying the $70.50 that it costs us to dispose of MSW today. So we have avoided cost of $105,750. This is brought forward as a net savings in the cost per year without having trash meeting of $105,750. When I add to that the renegotiated contract for MSW disposal of $99,000, you see in the central box under our current situation, we save $204,750 per year for the modest level of recycling that we currently do. Moving on to the next slide, this is a scenario whereby the Sanford Solid Waste uh, contract looks at having a trash metering program. Again, in the uh, lower left-hand side of the slide, you'll see the trucking contract of $694,000 for the same 7,000 tons of, of trash. When we had uh, a pay-as-you-throw recycling program here before, looking at the, that same level of performance that we know the, the community is capable of doing, we're estimating that the, uh, the MSW will go from 5,500 tons per year to 4,000 tons per year, and or 57%. So that's a 22% reduction in the amount of tons that we'll tip as MSW. Looking at what that does when that, that reduced tonnage comes to the transfer station in the upper corner of the slide, we, we anticipate to save at least $10,000 as far as reduced trucking and other cost savings for handling far less waste at our transfer station. So we'll bring that $10,000 down to the central slide for future additional savings. Coming across the top of the slide, you can see we already had renegotiated a contract that saved us $18 per ton or $99,000 per year. And then ultimately the smaller volume now, or 4,000 tons as opposed to 5,500 5, tons, goes to Casella for disposal at $70.50 per ton or a cost of $282,000 per year. Coming back to the trucking box in the lower left hand corner, out of that 7,000 tons by increasing our recycling rates by 22%, that's the benefit of a trash metering program that will be described to you here today. We, know, we anticipate to tip 3,000 tons as recyclables as opposed to MSW. We take that 3,000 instead of 1,500 tons to EcoMain. Again, we're going to tip that at zero dollars per ton. So we now have an avoided cost of $211,500. So 3,000 tons tipped at zero dollars per ton saves the municipality $211,500 per year. We previously had accounted for $105,000 in savings from the $1,500 ton per ton. We now have doubled that. So I'm going to bring in, if the community um, is accepting of this particular morning return program, we're going to bring the $105,000 of additional savings, add that to our reduced transfer cost of $10,000, and the community stands to save an additional $115,750. Moving to the next slide, uh, for this evening, the, the remaining presentations that are going to take place, the, first, the next presentation will be done by EcoMain, they are uh, to discuss uh, what it means for single sort recycling, what happens with uh, your recyclables once they're transferred to EcoMain, and what the benefits are of this flexible option. They are one of the uh, three partners the city will be partnering with to perfect this program. And then the final presentation will be done by Waste Zero to discuss trash metering and, and uh, as a mechanism to increase our recycling rates to produce savings for the municipality and the particular program that they have designed specific just to Sanford is called More in Return. After the presentations are completed, there will be a questions and answer following the presentations uh, to bring further information to you. Thank you.
<laughs> Hello, my name is Leo Mayhew, and I've been asked to come and talk to you today a little bit about the recycling that you guys do, and what happens to your recycled materials, and what it is that you guys can do to increase your recycling rate. So, I'm an environmental educator, and I work for EcoMaine, and we are a nonprofit, municipality owned uh, waste handling corporation uh, here in the state of Maine. We've got 46 communities that we partner with, and we process about 25% of the recyclables, solid waste, and such for the state of Maine. We do that um, by operating three different facilities. We have our waste to energy facility, our single sort recycling center, and our landfill Asheville. Now, we like to see ourselves as pretty much a, an all-incorporated uh, waste processing facility. And by having those three facilities, we're really able to watch the waste stream as it goes all throughout the way to make sure that it's taken care of in as responsible a manner as possible. Uh, we are really dedicated to making sure that the waste stream is taken care of in as responsible and environmentally sustainable a manner as possible. And we have the great state of Maine here to help back us up. Maine is wonderful for numerous reasons, but for our purposes here, the state has got a waste hierarchy in place. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with the waste hierarchy, you can imagine it's a triangle that at the very pinnacle of the triangle, the tip top, is what you want to be doing the most of. It's the most important thing. And down at the bottom of the triangle is the thing that you want to be doing, well, the least of, and it's not quite as advantageous as the, as the start. It goes a little something like this. You want to reduce as much of your waste as possible. So don't buy excess packaging or eat all your food at supper. Then you want to reuse as much as you possibly can. So take your peanut butter jar and clean it out and turn it into a, a container for macaroni or your jam jar and use it as a pencil cup, things like that. Then you want to recycle all of the things that are recyclable. You want to compost all of your organic food scraps and waste. You want to send the remainder to a waste energy facility so that it can be sustainably processed and turned into, well, electricity. And then finally, you want to actually enter your waste into the ground in a landfill. The reason behind all that is that by going through those steps, you're able to pull out as much as you possibly can from the waste stream and give it new life, reuse it, recycle it, what have you, so that what you're actually interring in the ground and actually having to then monitor for environmental hazard reasons is a much, much smaller percentage than what you started with. So it's all very good for me to stand up here and really, you know, talk the talk and tell you how wonderful that EcoMain is, but we want to make sure that we can show you that we're walking the walk. So we have a pair of certifications, the International Standards Organization ISO 14001 and the OSAS 18001. The 14001 is a certification for environmental stewardship and the 18001 is a certification for health and safety. Now, we have those certifications for all three of our facilities, and we've had them for as long as we've been going after them. So, as proof of our sustainability, there you have it. So, what happens to your single stream recycling? Now, you all here in the city of Sanford have your red labeled recycling bins. You put all your recyclable materials in that one bin, you set it out to the side, and it gets picked up, but what happens to it? Well, the trucks will come by, they'll pick up your recycling containers, and then they'll ship it up to our recycling facility in Eco, Maine, right in Portland. Now, all of that material comes mixed up in that single stream, and it gets deposited on our tipping floor. Now, the slide that you see here is just a day's worth of recyclable material that we will typically get. We get from all 46 of our communities about 35,000 tons of recyclable material. Now, since it's so easy for you in the single stream process to just toss all of your recyclables together in one bin, the job is on us to actually sort it out to the different component parts. The way that we first start by doing that is, the, as you can see in the slide, the front end loader will actually pick up their recyclable material and deposit it on the conveyor belt. The conveyor belt will take it through the facility and separate it out in a multi-step process that can be pretty much broken up into a couple of ways. First, we have mechanical sorting. What you see in the slide here is a, our first set of uh, screw star screens. What you see is a large rubber star, and that is attached to an axle, which travels very fast. 
What it does is it acts kind of like a sieve, where the larger material will pass over the stars and be deposited on a belt, and the smaller material will fall through. Now we have several different sets of this. The one in the slide that you can see is sorting for cardboard. So that larger cardboard passes over and everything else falls through. We also have an electric, uh, a pair of electrical magnets, an electromagnet for the ferrous metals, like tin, and an eddy current magnet for the non-ferrous metals, like aluminum. We also have a glass crusher and separator to pull that out of the stream. But that's not all. We also have an optical sorting machine. The optical sorting machine that we have is really whiz-bang fancy and new for us, and it's also very expensive. But pretty much what it does is it has this electronic eye that sees the material as it passes underneath it and can register whatever we tell it to. We have it set up to spot the number one PET plastic, or the clear plastic water bottles, soda bottles, that sort of thing. Once it sees that bottle pass underneath it, it can tell a jet of air to blow and pick up that bottle and deposit it on the appropriate belt. Now to give you an idea of how efficient and fast this thing goes, the belt traveling underneath the eye is going at about a yard a second, so it's able to really pick out a lot of that material. However, that's not the only way. We also have good old-fashioned manual sorters. EcoMain's recycling facility employs anywhere between 17 to 31 individuals, depending upon the season, and it's their job to, by hand, sort out the recyclable materials as it travels past them. The gentleman that you can see in this slide, it's his job to pick out the cardboard that didn't make it through that first cardboard screen. And, unfortunately, all of the non-recycled materials and garbage that, unfortunately, will make it through. We also employ, through this workforce, a labor release program through the prison system, so it gives them an opportunity to work out some of their time. Now, once everything has been sorted out, it then gets bailed up. Each of these bales that you can see weigh, weigh anywhere between 1,200 and 2,200 pounds. And to give you a sense of scale, remember a one ton weighs about 2,000 pounds. So each of these bales weighs close to a ton, depending upon the material. Now once these bales have been stored and set aside, we then have trucks that will come by and pick up those bales and ship them off to the facilities that will then process them and turn them into new recyclable goods. So, what happens to it and where does it go? Well, our recyclable materials, we sell it through a bidding process, so our vendors are constantly changing all the time. But a good rule of thumb is that if one piece of recyclable material, say a tin can, it starts life as a tin can, through the process it inevitably will become another tin can. To give you an idea of some of the things, our old corrugated cardboard we ship off, it goes straight to the paper mill, gets pulped up and turned into more co corrugated car cardboard. Uh, aluminum gets turned into more aluminum cans or tin foil. And plastics, such as your number one PET plastic, those clear plastic bottle bo water bottles I was telling you about, they'll get sent off and turned into more clear plastic bo water bottles, or, because of the nature of the plastic, will be spun into very thin, thin fibers, which then will go into recycled carpeting or the fleece that I'm wearing. Number two natural plastic, like milk jugs, will be turned into, well, more milk jugs, but because they're naturally colored, they don't have any color added to them, they can take a lot of very delicate colors and turn into a lot of the plastics that we have. And the three through seven plastics will be sent out and turned into all of the different variety of plastic material that we have, like your keyboards and computer mice, that sort of thing. So, that's great, all of our stuff is going out, but it seems like a lot of work, right? Well, there's an advantage to the single stream uh, method of recycling, and is that it makes it so much easier for you, the resident, for you, the recycler, to actually go about the business of recycling. Instead of, like, in the old days, where you had multiple different you know, choices to make. You had to take your tin cans and pull the labels off of it. You had to scrub out all of your peanut butter from your peanut butter jar. You had to make sure everything was isolated in its own box and bring it to the transfer station and do it over again. With single stream, it's just one choice. Is it recyclable or is it trash? And if it's recyclable, it goes in your red bin. If it's trash, it goes in the trash. Now, that sounds great for you, but does it really work? How does it really help? Well, we found that on average, the single sort method, it jumps recycling rates up about 20%, which is huge. 
So, to give you an idea of some of the success stories we've seen, Monmouth, when they went to single stream recycling, jumped up 33%, that was their recycle rate, in the first year alone. And you guys, the city of Sanford, when you had your recycling incentivizing program prior, your recycling rate jumped up 139% from where it was earlier. So, to show a little bit more of what you guys are doing with us, We've been in partnership um, for a few years now, and we will be in partnership for a while to come. And we've had the opportunity to get a couple of different numbers, uh, or at least a couple of few years of um, data from your recycling rates to really see how you guys are doing. And as you can see in the graph, when you guys started out in the fiscal year of 2009 and 2010, you were doing fairly good. You were hovering right at around 800, 900 tons. Then, when you went to your recycling incentivizing program, you jumped straight up to nearly 1,900 tons. And slowly but surely, unfortunately, your recycling rate has been coming down. So we hope that we'll be able to find a way to get you guys to start recycling a little bit more. Now, really to, to play to your hearts here, a, a piece of recycled material, yes, not only uh, is it you know, good for the town in that the recycling is a no-cost solution for you guys, it is being pulled out and turned into something else, but that piece of recyclable material really has a longer life than what you, you, know, what, what you have when you throw it away. To give you an idea of some of the things that are easily recyclable material that just kind of hangs around, a, a piece of paper, like say a traffic ticket, will stay there, tossed out on the ground, for two to three weeks before it actually breaks down. Other things like metal can take hundreds of years before they can actually rust away and decompose. And things like plastic, which not only is just litter in the streets, but can potentially be environmentally harmful to, say, sea turtles or wildlife, can last for hundreds of hundreds of years, upwards of 800 years, and some things like glass or styrofoam, we have no idea if it ever breaks down and will just always be glass or styrofoam. So to give you an idea of what some of the things that you know, we can do to fix the problem, right? we can recycle. And let's just say we're going to be lazy recyclers. We're only going to recycle one thing. Let's recycle paper. Now that paper, if we just only recycled paper, one ton of paper, not only is going to be taken out of the garbage, out of the landfill, off of the streets, it also will be saving in resources. That one ton of paper is going to save you 17 trees from being cut down and turned into paper pulp. It will also save about 7,000 gallons of water from going through that pulping process. Several hundred gallons of oil from fueling those machines to then use the water to turn those new trees into paper, and on and on and on. We find that out of all of our recycling stream, 61% of what we're getting is paper products. So if you take that one ton and you multiply it 61% out, and then you add up all of the trees and the oil and everything else that you're saving, you can see how it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, the savings that you have. And that's only paper. Imagine petroleum products such as plastic or the like. I think the numbers speak for themselves. So what can we do? What can we recycle? We know paper works, right? What else? Well, the general rubric is that if it's paper, plastic, metal, or glass, you've got a really good chance of being able to recycle it. Paper, any newspaper, any old mail, office copy paper, all good to recycle. Cardboard, totally recyclable. Um, cereal boxes, that sort of thing, completely good. Plastic, you want to make sure that the chasing arrow symbol on the is on the bottom of whatever plastic you have to recycle, and that it has the numbers 1 through 7 inside that chasing arrow symbol. Also with plastic, you want to make sure that it's a rigid container of some sort, because the thin films, as I'll mention in a moment, can be a problem. Also, any tin, aluminum, uh, glass, that sort of thing, you're all set. Just goes in that one red labeled bin for you. So, every rule has got its exception, right? Really, the few things that we see a lot of that you know, are kind of a questionable item are styrofoam, plastic bags, and then things like paper towels, napkins, that sort of thing. Styrofoam, oftentimes you'll see on the bottom, it has the chasing arrow symbol with a number in it. 
Well, that styrofoam is technically plastic and can technically be recycled. However, it's a matter of market. And up here in the Northeast, we aren't living anywhere near a place that will actually accept styrofoam and process it into a new styrofoam product. And the shipping costs involved of taking that styrofoam, which is mostly air, and trying to cram it together and put it on a truck and send it out is just not feasible. The truckers will love you for letting them drive with nothing, but your gas bill won't. Now, plastic bags, you can recycle your plastic shopping sacks. So the uh, Hannaford shopping bags or the, the kind of bags that you get at like Walmart or Target that have your purchases in them. Those are good to go. They're not contaminated with any kind of food waste, and typically they have the number two or four on the bottom of them. Other bags, like your Ziploc bags or your cling film, like saran wrap, that sort of thing, unfortunately, because it most likely has been contaminated with food waste, it's not seen as a recyclable product because of that food contamination. And the same goes for those paper towels, napkins, that sort of thing. Ask, what are you really using Kleenex for? The recyclers don't necessarily want to see that sort of thing. So really it comes down to a matter of it's our trash, it's also our legacy. You know, we're finding that archaeologists and cultural anthropologists are having just great times finding midden heaps or shell mounds or garbage dumps from ancient civilizations because they're able to look through the strata of their waste and find out about who they were and how they lived their life and what it was that they valued by what it was that they threw away. Do we want archaeologists hundreds of years from now to take a look at our midden heaps, our shell mounds, or our landfills and see all of this recyclable material in it? All of this stuff that we could have pulled out and used as, you know, given new life as new products? Do we want to be seen as the wasters or the recyclers? Anyway, thank you very much. Uh, again, my name is Leo Mayhew, and if any of you have any questions, please go to our website, www.ecomain.org, or give me a phone call or send me an email, and we'd love to help you out. Thanks again. Hi there, I'm Steve Osaskis from Waste Zero, and I'm here to talk about the More in Return program that's proposed for Sanford. Uh, just a couple of pieces of information as we begin. First, Waste Zero, we're the nation's largest waste reduction company. I'll talk about that uh, a little bit in just a moment. Uh, we're working under contract um, with Sanford to help explore this program. Uh, as a note on that contract, uh, if the community decides not to move forward with the More in Return program, uh, that is something that's complete within the, the community's right, uh, and the community can cancel our contract at any time what we're doing now is the uh, outreach portion of, um, the, of the More in Return program to determine what people are indeed comfortable with. There is no commitment on the community's part at any point uh, with regard to the program. Uh, we're just doing education and community outreach at this point. And secondly, the program that we're talking about here today is a waste reduction program, and it's using specialized trash bags. It's not a program that deals, uh, that specifically deals with recycling. Recycling doesn't need to go into a bag. Nothing changes. It still goes into the red bins you use today. So the program is a trash program that will help people recycle, uh, similar to other programs that exist uh, in the marketplace that help people reduce solid waste. It's not a recycling program per se, but it does help uh, increase recycling. So um, why did Sanford choose to partner with Waste Zero as part of the uh, education and outreach portion uh, of examining more in return? Well, first, Waste Zero partners with 800 cities and towns across the United States, across uh, 42 states. And we have, there are 33 um, communities we partner with in Maine, several um, right nearby, uh, folks that we are part, uh, proud to partner with, communities we're proud to work with. And we've been in this business for over 20 years now, and 98% of the programs that we've started are still up and running successfully, uh, which tells us uh, that the programs are well designed and, and well implemented, uh, and we think speaks effectively to the partnership relationship we develop with the communities that we're proud to work with. As a note, we are a manufacturer. We are a U.S. manufacturer of plastic bags used in waste reduction programs, and everything we do is oriented toward what's our mission of American prosperity. So we manufacture in the United States in our plant in South Carolina. 
we source our raw materials, our equipment. Um, we, as employees, are encouraged to buy American. Our families are as well. So everything is designed toward uh, helping create more jobs, more industry in the United States, as well as partnering with cities and towns to help them save money as a way to continue to either reduce the cost of government or to continue to provide valuable public services uh, to residents of communities across the United States. And we have a, a variety of offices, as you can see here, uh, across the United States that helps us work with the cities and towns we work with. So what services do we provide as a company? This is the last bit uh, about us and then a little bit more on the program, but we thought it was important to let you know who we are and what we do so you can understand uh, the program, but also uh, the, the folks who are helping with the outreach. Um, as part of the services we provide, it's trash metering, as you, as you can see at the top, is what we call our program. And we have a program coordinator who coordinates both the supplies, which we manufacture here in the United States, as I mentioned, and the services. And those services include the education, outreach, accounting, websites, toll-free numbers, so if people want to know where they can recycle a particular material, what can I do um, with this refrigerator that has Freon in it, how do I recycle that, that we provide that level of support at a very detailed level to the communities we partner with. And so we have a program coordinator whose job it is is to help the community uh, and to help the residents of that community of the community uh, accomplish your goals, which is to reduce the amount of money you're paying for trash, to increase your recycling, which improves the environment, uh, improves the finances, and improves the public services that you receive. And you can see at the bottom here there are a variety of uh, bags that we provide. Pay as you throw is one. Um, curbed up. Uh, Street collection, excuse me, off street collection um, for special events and other uh, and other bags are things that just a snapshot of things that we provide as services. Now, why is Sanford um, exploring this? Through our conversations with uh, policymakers here uh, in Sanford, um, I think this chart talks a lot about why we're having this con continue to have this conversation uh, over the last several weeks that we've been having it. First, as you can see, back in 2010. The uh, then town uh, implemented a purple bag program, it's pay as you throw program. And you saw right away the solid waste plummet very significantly. Now across the 800 communities we partner with, we see this chart all the time, or at least that portion of the chart, where waste drops between 44 and 46 percent, and Sanford was actually more than that, uh, right away within the first week or two of program implementation. And the pay as you throw program, a bag based solution, to waste reduction provides people an incentive that says, do I want to put this glass bottle in the trash in a bag that I have to pay for, or do I want to put it in my red recycling bin where it's free of charge? So that the, these programs done extensively across 7,000 communities in the U.S. and many communities across Europe and, and in other uh, countries provides people that incentive, and so you see that very significant drop. And then as everyone knows, I'm sure, there was a referendum that occurred and the voters said we no longer wish to do this program and you saw right away an increase in solid waste and which continued which has continued to be a gradual increase in trash tonnage uh, to where we're nearly uh, back to where we started back in 2010. Now that has a couple of implications for the community. One, we know we can recycle more, we know we can reduce trash because we did it before. Secondly, there is a, this, this increasing trend has increased costs over time, and it's increased costs in some pretty significant ways because the, the community was saving a significant amount of money by reducing trash, and now that's, that's nearly back to where it was to begin with. So the question came, is there a way to get the performance like you see down here where the solid waste dropped significantly without effectively charging people for the solid waste. So that was a, that's the question um, that a lot of people have been thinking about for some time. Can we get the benefit without the thing that the voters said they didn't want to do, which was to pay for bag for trash? So a number of communities around Sanford, and you can see them here, um, are partaking in a pay as you throw or a trash metering program. We work with some communities, we don't work with all of them, but there are a variety of communities, I mentioned 33 in Maine that we work with, uh, a variety of communities in the area, 7,000 nationally, as I mentioned earlier, who have undertaken a pay-as-you-throw approach or another approach to reducing solid waste. 
And so after looking at what's all available in the marketplace and thinking a great deal about it and, and talking mm -hmm. to people, we looked and came up with the More in Return program. And so what's the process behind the More in Return program? So the More in Return program feels similar at the beginning to a pay as you throw program, but it is fundamentally different. So the first thing you see all the way over to the side here under step one is you as a resident would purchase a bag or a series of trash bags uh, at the grocery store. So instead of buying a name brand um, bag or another bag at the grocery store, you would buy a Sanford bag. The money that is that raised that that's generated that way. Let's say it's um, just because the math is easier for my head. A uh, dollar fifty per bag. If it's a dollar fifty per bag, that dollar fifty is put in a separate bank account, as you can see here in step two, and that money is put in that account. It's insured to make sure it's not lost if the market goes crazy as it did a few years ago. It's money that's locked safely away. At the end of the year, that money is rebated back to residents. So at the front end, while you're paying for that, the bags, at the back end, that money comes back to you. And I'll talk a little bit in just a moment about how that works. Uh, but what you're seeing here is a program that rebates the bag revenue and it addresses, from, from my perspective, from the discussions we've had, a significant portion of the concerns that we think the voters expressed back when the pay as you throw program was overturned was that they, they, the pay portion was a problem. So more in return is something that takes the pay out of pay as you throw because you receive a rebate. And as you can see here in step three, um, the results really, the taxpayers receive their government a lower cost, the city saves money which allows uh, you to provide more services, receive other benefits uh, that saving money provides um, for everyone. So talking a little bit more about how the rebate works. So if we assume everybody, um, well, we'll look at three scenarios here. We'll look at somebody who generates little waste, somebody who generates the average, and somebody who generates um, a, a lot of waste more than average. So if you generate the average amount of waste, you get the average amount of revenue back. So we took the money, put it in a bank account, and kept it safe and secure for everyone. And at the end of the year, people get the average back. So that's what you see in the middle slide here, or the middle, uh, the middle chart with the, the two bags there that if you generated, the, if you paid for the average, you get the average amount of revenue back. And so for you, that's a break-even proposition. If you generate very little waste, which you see with the one small bag um, over at the side, what you, what you end up doing is you still get the average amount of revenue back. No one's tracking to see how many bags of waste you throw away. You can still throw away a lot. You could throw away a little. But what you see with that small bag is if you generate less waste than average, you still get the average rebate back, you just made money. So you have the opportunity to make money under this rebate program. But in the same vein, if, if you generate a large amount of waste, more than average amount of waste, what ends up happening is you are a net payer into the program. So if the average rebate is $120 and you paid $150 for your bag, at the end of the year you would have paid 30 But an interesting dynamic happens here. First, you're in control of how much you want to throw away. If the, e the EPA talks about, depends on the year and, and what's manufactured and what's disposed of, between 64 and 67 percent of waste can be recycled. So we really do have a lot of control as to how many bags we use. And part of our job, um, if, we decide, if the, uh, the community decides to move forward with the program, is to make sure people know about those things and the 800 number and the websites are all part of the education and the outreach to make sure people know what can re re be recycled and how to do it. But the inter really interesting dynamic here is because everybody gets the average amount of revenue back, they get the average amount of trash for free. So what you have today is somebody who's generating a lot of waste is currently shifting, because they're only paying for the average in their taxes, they're shifting the extra waste, the more than average, onto everybody else in the community. And so what you have is a program that's fundamentally fair, because even the high waster, someone who throws away a lot of trash, is only paying for the extra that, they're ta that they would otherwise be shifting onto their neighbors. Now, there's obviously some concern that people may have that says, hold on, we don't have that conversation around education, for instance. That's right, we don't nationally. And there's a reason for that, because with education, police, fire, other public services, 
there's a fundamental public good to it. The communities that have higher levels of, levels of education have stronger economies, have better employment rates, have lower crime. Communities that have strong police or fire presences have a variety of public benefits that, that flow to everyone, and that's why everyone pays them in taxes. But what, fundamentally, what's the public benefit of your neighbor being able to throw away more trash and shift that cost onto everyone else? So the program is designed to make that, that cost fair and that cost will represent the amount people are generating uh, in terms of waste because there isn't an overall societal, societal benefit to me throwing away more trash than my neighbor. So how is more in return different than the pay-as-you-throw program? As I mentioned before, the first step, it kind of feels like it because you're still buying the bags, but from then on it's different because you get the money back. So as you can see on the top here, the pay, under the pay-as-you-throw program, all the way over um, on the left, the residents would purchase the bags uh, and recycle. The money for the bags would then flow to town hall and be used to provide important public services. Now what we're looking at for the more in return program is still purchasing bags, as you can see down at the bottom, but that purchase of the bag, that revenue comes right back to the residents. So it's not a program like pay as you throw has been, where the money goes from residents, the bag revenue goes from residents to providing public services, it goes from the residents right back to the residents and provides an important incentive for people to recycle because you can get a rebate and because you can get a rebate larger than the amount of money that you put into the program. We certainly welcome um, your feedback and the opportunity to provide any information that might be of assistance to you. Um, should you need to get in touch with us or have any questions for us, I know um, the city would be happy to provide our contact information. You're also willing to call me uh, at my direct phone number, which is area code 617-299-8012. That's 617-299-8012. And again, my name is Steve Wilsoskis, and thank you very much for your time and attention. Hi, my name is Maura Hurley, and welcome back to our discussion of the Waste Zero's new More in Return program. We've switched to a roundtable discussion format because during our, uh, during our meetings with the public, we've gotten a bunch of questions, and we have a lot of them ready to be answered, and we'd like to take the most common questions that have been asked and have the roundtable discuss, answer, and hopefully resolve many of the issues you may have right now. Uh, tonight... Today we have with us, I'm going to reintroduce everybody, we have Sarah Bernier, who's the representative from Waste Zero from, from Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont. Joining us again is Steve Lazowskis, who is the Vice President for Waste Zero. Also Charles Anderson, he is our Public Works Director, and he's going to take over the city's role in answering the questions today. Leo Mayhew is back from Eco Maine. If we have any more uh, questions on recycling, he'll be able to answer those. And joining me today, we have... Councillor Brad Littlefield, who's been spearheading much of the work being done to educate the public for more in return. So Brad, why don't you start with the first question? Thank you, Maura. Uh, the first question, I guess, goes to Charlie. Uh, does the program change the recycling procedures followed by residents with the curbside collection? No, it doesn't, Brad. The curbside collection program um, will only be impacted for the solid waste part of the stream. So when people uh, recycle, we hope this program will encourage them to put more recycling out in the red bins or trash barrels with the big red stickers on them. Uh, but uh, there's not going to be a bag fee or anything of that nature for the recycling. So the recycling component of this program remains free to the residents. They don't have to buy bags to put their recycling out at the curb. The next question goes to Steve Lazowskis or Sarah, if you think you can answer it better. How do we know that the funds will be returned to the residents if more in return is enacted? Great. Well, thank you, Mayor, for the question. The, there are a couple of ways that we know. First, uh, there will, if the city decides to move forward with the program, um, there would be a contract between the city and Waste Zero that would require that it happen. And the money will be put in a separate fund. Um, that is titled to the city, not titled to us. It's the, the, the money will be there for the city for the rebate. And that money will be in a, it's in a special fund. It pays no interest, unfortunately, but it's fully guaranteed. 
So instead of putting it in an interest-bearing account, which would be you know half a percent or less of interest anyway, which would only be insured up to a hundred or one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars, and then you could have a question as to will the bank that's holding the money still be there two years from now or a year from now? Um, we're looking at an account that is fully insured, fully protected. So at the end of the year, when the rebate comes due, the money is there and available to be paid to the residents. Thank you very much. Steve, I got a follow-up question for that. Uh, you answered the first part of my question, which who holds the money. But second question, and I've had a, a number of uh, uh, residents ask me this: How is the money accounted for? How does the city see it? How does sure? You know, okay. Great. Well, thank you. Um, so. We operate programs in uh, 800 cities and towns across 42 states. And in those communities, we handle funds for, a, for a, a pretty substantial number of communities. And each one has its own separate account. And so what we do every month is send a report by store for each community as to how many bags were sold in that community. So if there are 10 stores selling bags in Sanford, as an example, you will receive every month a breakdown by the date of order, the number of bags ordered, the amount of money paid. So we'll send you a live, essentially a live accounting of that. And then you can not only see the bags being ordered and shipped, but you can also see the revenue going into the account because we'll send that to you as well. So we'll send that to you on a monthly basis uh, and can provide access to the community more often than that if necessary, uh, or if you, if you would like. But it's, it will be accounted for consistent with gap accounting standards uh, and it will be something that you'll have eyes on and we want to be as public and transparent as possible with the information so you feel comfortable that the money is there and the money will be able to be returned at the end of the year. Just for everybody's uh, information, GAP means Government Accounted Program? That, that's right. So we follow a couple of principles, uh, of different accounting principles. We'll, we follow the generally accepted accounting principles. We also work uh, in accordance with some uh, where we intersect with the governments. We follow the government accounting standards as well. So we'll do, we'll do both. But fundamentally, we want to make sure you're comfortable. So if there's a procedure that works better for you than others, um, we're happy to, to make sure that, the, that, the, um, that what we're we're providing for reporting works for you to make sure you're comfortable and you can answer the questions that you'll receive uh, from the community about where the money is. Thank you, Steve. Certainly. Thank you. Okay. How will the qualifying list be developed and man maintained? I would assume that this is a question both for Waste Zero, um, Steve Lazowskis, and also for Charles Anderson, you know because it's going to be a joint effort. Why don't I try to, why don't I try to explain that, and then uh, Steve or Sarah can join in. Uh, what the contract provides for um, is that the city um, establishes the list of qualified participants in the program who will be eligible for the rebates. Um, in doing that, we'll be assisted by um, Way Zero um, in developing that program, uh, that list. But the final uh, version of that list will be approved by the city. So they're not they're not finally the responsible party. So we'll work with our existing tax records, um, use our GIS mapping system to determine locations of parcels and where properties are specifically located, which ones are eligible for the curbside collection program, which ones aren't. And those that are eligible for the curbside collection program will go onto the list. And then as part of the development of that list, they will be included in the um, um, sleeves of bags are going to be sold at the stores, registration certificates. So when folks buy the uh, certificate, uh, buy the bags, there'll be a registration certificate there for them to notify Waste Zero, either by phone, by mail, or on the website of their name and address and the fact that they are purchasing bags and they feel that they're eligible for the rebates. And we will check those registrations against the, against the list that we'll put together of eligible um, properties to participate in the program. And that's how the, that's how the list will be um, generally um, put together. Steve, do you have anything to add to this? Uh, I think that was a great summary. I mean, certainly the firm that um, we've, so we've talked to uh, 
about 15 firms that are in the business professionally of doing rebates. Mm -hmm. And they have checks that they'll do as well to make sure that uh, all the information that we've pulled together through this cooperative process um, it sort of works with the information that they see. So it's a, it's, a, uh, it's a process, as Charlie indicated, of pulling together the information, then there's a check on it mm -hmm. to make sure that everything's moving smoothly before the check before the cards uh, go out to issue the uh, the rebates but uh, it's as exactly as Charlie indicated great thank you so Steve uh, what happens if somebody moves from one location to another location in Sanford what, what happens then what, you know how do we take care of that sure so the registration is an annual it ha occurs annually so if you move during the year um, from one house in Sanford to another house you're still in Sanford, so it will not it will not be something that will would change for you. It's not that we're tracking how many bags an individual uses in one house versus another. It's that you're a resident of Sanford uh, during the the eligibility period um, that provides people the ability to get the rebate. And just as, for instance, when I moved into to my home, um, there was a thirty some odd dollar credit on the water bill. Um, if you're looking at a hundred and twenty dollar um, rebate. If I move into town, that's something that can also be happen at a real estate transaction. If Sarah moves out and I move in, that's something that can be taken care of at closing uh, or in a rental agreement. So it's something that is, that's been planned for and anticipated, uh, and it's something that you just register for and the rebate will be there for you. So, so will there be a registration card? Will I have a, like a change of address so people know where the card, to, where you need to send the card uh, once the people have moved? So what we'll see, so in year two, mm -hmm. what we'll see is you were in one address in year one, now you're in a different address in year two because you registered twice, mm -hmm. and we'll know just to, to contact to make okay. sure that, we're, I mean, we're not trying to get too much into where people are moving, live wherever you'd like, but we just want to make sure that there's not going to be two registrations from an individual. Mm -hmm. So we'll be able to see from year one and year two the change and just make a note that we need to reach out to make sure that that's yeah, sure. okay. And, and I think if someone moves in the during a current year, so they start they start and register for the program in one location, they move stay within Sanford, move to another location, then it's going to be incumbent on them to give that new location address through the registration form to contact Way Zero. Uh, again, it should be either by mail, telephone, or online. Let them know that they've had a change of address, but they're still within the city of Sanford. That new location would have to be checked against our qualifying list to make sure that that new location is still an eligible location, and then they'd be qualifying for the reimbursement. I think it's important to remember that um, multifamily housing properties, uh, apartment buildings with more than four um, apartments in them, are not eligible for the curbside collection or for the reimbursement program. So if you move from a single family home into an apartment complex or a condominium complex, then um, you would not continue to be eligible for the uh, rebate on the purchase price of the bags because your landlord or your condominium association is then responsible for the disposal of the trash. Thank you. Okay, so in detail, Mr. Lozowskis, <coughs> what service does Waste, Waste Zero provide and how much will they be paid for these services in bulk? Sure. So Waste Zero provides a variety of services, education and outreach. We will host a website that will provide a variety of information where you can purchase the bags um, for hard to recycle items, how, does, how do you recycle them, um, all sorts of information to help people reduce the amount of waste they're generating and therefore the amount of waste they'll have to pay for initially to get the money back, but how much they'll have to lay out initially. I put an 800 number for uh, people who don't want to go on the web, but would rather call. Um, we do all the manufacturing of the bags, distribution, accounting, as we as we talked about earlier, um, a variety of services. Um, and in some instances, a community may, may only want 80% of them, some may want 100%. We provide whatever is helpful in terms of a service. In terms of compensation, it's part of the overall cost of the program. Mm -hmm. It's not something we charge extra for. Um, it's something that you can elect to do certain things, but we don't charge extra for them. It's as part of our overall cost of, of the program. Mm -hmm. Great. I think, I think order of magnitude wise, um, we anticipate that uh, the fee that actually um, 
accrues to waste zero for their efforts will be in the ninety to one hundred thousand dollar a year range. Um, that's for the provision of the bags and all the other services that uh, Steve has already mentioned. Um, and then, if the town is wildly successful, then they would get a, a small additional fee based on the savings that the uh, city realizes in the avoided tip fees. And that goal has been very, very aggressively set. And I think with the savings that the city would have, um, you know, I think we'll all be pleased to be paying that additional bonus to them if they get us to a point where um, we're more successful with this program than they were than we were under the previous one. Thank you. Uh, Charlie, a uh, uh, couple of times at the uh, this forum, uh, um, a couple of folks have brought up the idea of why can't we just, you know, why can't we just require folks to recycle, uh, enforce the ordinance more vigorously? Uh, <coughs> why do we need to go to a program like this? Uh, practically speaking, enforcement of a recycling ordinance um, is difficult and contentious. Um, I think folks are familiar with the legal system, uh, the way it works, how overburdened it is, uh, how prosecutors have to prioritize uh, their time and their abilities to uh, prosecute cases. And it will be very difficult to anticipate that uh, they would be aggressively pursuing any uh, citations that we would be issuing for folks not recycling. I just don't see that as rising to a, a high level. So it sounds good on paper and theoretically speaking to just enact an ordinance and people recycle. Um, but, um, you know, it, it, it would be practically impossible to enforce in an effective way. And maybe Steve could comment on um, on those kinds of programs where you depend on just public education and no other incentives, what the levels of uh, recycling might be expected to be in comparison with this kind of a program? Sure. So we uh, often work with communities that have either tried uh, public education first um, or have really been working public education for quite some period of time. And even after that, we'll see a reduction of 44 to 46 percent in solid waste even after the program. Uh, one community we're working with now actually spent a year really focused on community outreach and education on recycling, and they saw a 1 percent increase in recycling from 11 percent to 12 percent uh, and so what we the because we sort of live in this world, we sort of think about this all the time. And what we've sort of come to realize is if every week I can put out all the trash I want essentially for free, it's not for free, the taxpayers have to pay for it, um, but it feels free because if I put out one bag or 10 bags, it's the same cost, that that's the most education, that's the most impactful education in saying put this glass bag in the recycling is important and I need to know it, but it's not the only thing. It has to be a couple, it has to be the education, the knowledge working together with the pricing incentive to really, really make that, to drive that change. Thank you. This has been a relatively sensitive issue on both sides, so um, Charlie, you'll probably have to handle this one because it's a city question. Will the city pay for bags for those who say they can't afford to buy them? I've had people comment on both sides of this question. <coughs> um, the city will not pay for bags for folks who can't afford them. If, if folks have uh, financial problems, they have to pursue the avenues that are available to them. Um, if it's general assistance, then they have to go uh, see the administrator for the general assistance program. Um, I think that benefit of the program, the way it's conceived is that folks, if you're looking at the elderly, for example, who are maybe on fixed income and they think it's going to be a hardship to buy, to pay and buy these bags, that they'll be the folks, by and large, who will make money at the end of the year when the program's over. Um, they're, going to, they're going to recycle effectively. They're going to generate small amounts of waste. So in terms of bags that they buy to put trash at the curbside, uh, they're going to buy the least of anyone. So they'll be below the average, and when they get their reimbursement or their rebate at the end of the year, the rebate will more than cover the price of the bags. So there may be a little bit of hardship or inconvenience to buy those bags initially, uh, but um, 
by the end of the first year, they should receive enough money uh, to offset what they had to spend and use the excess money to finance their purchase of bags for the coming year. So that's the focus of the program is to be fair to everybody uh, who puts waste out at the curb, not have folks who put out small amounts subsidize those who put out large amounts. And so I think it'll be, you know, effective for folks on fixed incomes also. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, that was a good segue into the next question, I guess. So where will the bags be purchased? How will I get one? So the bags um, are can be purchased at any, we work with hundreds of retailers in some communities we work with up to 147. Um, the community has a good network of stores uh, and a good network of stores that participated in the program in 2000, in the Page to Throw program in 2010. Uh, and the reason I looked at Sarah is Sarah's already been talking to those um, stores to see if there is going to be a program, a more in return program, would they be willing to participate in the program? So um, we've already spoken to a number of those stores uh, about the program and their interest in participating and and other stores can can join in as well. It's really uh, our preference is to have as many stores as possible. So no matter where a resident goes shopping, the bags are available. And certainly, um, the city has made it clear to us that having a really good distribution is important because it needs to be a convenience for folks. Thank you. Okay, what size are the bags? That that um, I think people are interested in. But I think most of most interest is. How well are they going to be made? What's going to be the thickness of the bags? Are they going to be better than that initial bat, uh, batch of bags that everybody complained about? And that'll allow that um, most of our residents go into the grocery store and check it out and compare the bags in the grocery store to what they'll be getting from eco uh, from Waste Zero. Can I can I take the first part of that? <laughs> you may. Um, I just um, the bags that we anticipated um, initially were 33 gallon and 15 gallon trash bags. Um, I think we've received input from the public forums that we've um, had so far, with some folks suggesting that an eight-gallon bag might be an attractive enticement for them also and make it more practical for them to uh, uh, function in their, in their household. And so, um, again, this is all going back to the Solid Waste Subcommittee of the City Council once these forums are finished for continued discussion. And it, it seems like there's been a receptivity on the part of the City Council to also consider um, the addition of, a, of an eight gallon bag. Um, so the range of the bags is still not quite finally determined. That's one of those items that will be discussed further by the subcommittee and then the City Council. And I will let Steve or Sarah talk to the quality of the bags and, and the issues with, with quality control. Sure. Oh. <clears throat> Excuse me. The 33-gallon um, bag, which is the large bag, it's about the size of an Ace Hardware garbage can that you would put out at the curb, and that is a one and a half mil thickness. And comparatively, if you were to go and get a 33-gallon bag of a major brand, you're going to look at between um, 0.7 mil and 1.1 mil. So our bags are much thicker than what you would purchase regularly to put out at the curb. And then the 15 gallon bag, which is about the size of a kitchen trash container, is uh, 1.35 mil. And again, that's thicker than what you would purchase at you know the 0.7 to 1.1 mil for those regular bags. And we're probably looking at something similar to the 1.35 mil for the eight gallon bag as well. Thank you. Uh I guess this is for Steve or Sarah. Uh, how much uh, will the reimbursement be, and uh, will everyone get the same amount back? Sure. I think uh, just looking at, we, we'll know at the end where we're projecting um, now, um, and I think we're looking at $110, $120 on average uh, being the rebate, uh, and everyone will get the same amount back, which provides that interesting dynamic where um, I can, act, as, as Charlie was talking about, somebody who's an aggressive recycler and really reduces their waste can make money from the program uh, because they're doing something that's right for everybody, the, the community as a whole. Um, so, so it'll be the same rebate um, for everyone. I just wanted to add that the because we're not tracking individual use of bags, it's much less personal on our part. So we really, it's your own decision how much waste you put out or how much little waste you put out. And it's not invasive. Some people are concerned that we were going to be counting what they had at the curb, and that's not the case at all. Yeah, I think we aren't going to, we're not going to track 
um, how many bags people buy. That's all going to be through general orders from the vendors to Waste Zero. Waste Zero will basically talk with the vendor and say, how many cases of bags do you want uh, or need this month? They will ship those bags. The bags will be sold by the vendor to the individual residents who buy them. There will be no tracking of whose name other than the registration slips inside the bags that are sold that folks will file themselves. So there is no tracking of people's trash per se. Um, the rebate comes to everyone as the average for the year and, and there's not going to be any monitoring of what an individual does or doesn't use. So if somebody's putting out 10 bags a week, um, we'll probably know that just by driving around the community and seeing where there's a lot of piles of bags. But we're not going to stop and ask why they're putting out so many bags, and we're not going to be opening their bags to see what's in them. Uh, so if somebody chooses to spend a lot of money buying trash bags and putting out that much trash, more power to them. That'll raise the average in the fund, and folks who are being more efficient will get more back. I suspect you're going to have some people in town who are going to track how much they purchase so at the end of the year they can see how much they earn. Uh, but that should be the very good recyclers. Yeah, and sure. those that are disappointed. I, I can tell already from the crowds we've been having that a few of them are going to, they're going to track what they're using it's, so it's they can a, see how much they earn. It's amazing yeah. what you can recycle. Yes, <laughs> it is, or compost. Yeah, exactly. I, I actually think I might be buying a comp. I haven't, I haven't composted yet, and I should. I think I'll be buying a compost. Well, and that's a good point. A lot of the waste just disappeared when we went with the previous program because people had to buy the bags. But clothing, um, very heavy, uh, very, very volume conscious. People were putting used clothes in the trash to dispose of them when they could have taken them to Goodwill or another agency and you know, could have been reutilized and, and recycled in a really effective and socially conscious way. Um, yard waste, people would sneak that into their trash. Well, then we're paying Grass at that point, you know, the, it, <laughs> last, uh, last year we would have been paying $86 <laughs> a ton to, to get rid of that stuff. But if it goes to the transfer station, we're basically composting that through a private uh, entity at Levine Farms. Mm -hmm. And so we send our yard waste there uh, at no cost to the city, basically. So uh, the awareness of paying for a bag mm -hmm. and the public education as to what the alternatives are are important components to really driving an effective recycling program. You know, and Charlie, that leads to the question because we've lost goodwill, as we all know, in this community. We'll, we'll have a, Catholic Charities is opening a store and there is a Salvation Army um, bin, but I think it would be nice if the transfer station added something where people could deposit their and use clothing. You know, that would make it a lot more convenient for yeah, them. You know, it's it's a, hard to go to Goodwill when it's only in Biddeford and Dover. Yeah, but there are Planet Aid and there are other depositories available in the community now. We have stayed away from that uh, at the transfer station simply because um, we haven't wanted to get engaged in whose recycling bins will allow to be placed there and whose we won't and we don't want to create a free-for-all of, uh, of agencies that collect clothing mm -hmm. to just want to kind of set up bins mm -hmm. if we can't have a criteria for who can do it and who can't. So we've stayed away from that there feeling that there were plenty of other outlets in the community for folks to dispose of uh, used clothing. Well, I'm not sure we're close-minded to it, but we just want to make sure we're fair and do it the right way. But that leads to a quick question. I'm sorry I'm off the track a little bit. Leo, I have a quick question for you. Yes. Say you have a t-shirt that's full of stains. Can it be recycled at all, or is that just trash? Well, certainly. If you go, like, say, to, you know, the Goodwill, right, you can give them all of your clothing. And what they will do is they'll go through that clothing and they'll make the judgment call whether it's something that they can sell and reuse in that sense, or if it's something that they can't sell and reuse, but they can repackage and sell to a cloth recycler. So if you remember, you know, rag paper, yeah. you used to make paper out of that cotton rag. Yeah. And if you ever go to, say, the, um, you know, your mechanic, mechanic or your you know car wash or whatever and those rags or if you go to the hardware store and you buy that box of rags right that's where those rags are coming from they're coming from those funky old t-shirts that no one wants anymore so in other words Good goodwill is an excellent recycler of used clothing yes they and so we can't do that in single well. stream yet yeah. 
No, not in single stream. I gotta tell you, clothes are the hard part. That's that's a, that's a tough thing to get rid of. So it's actually great to have this conversation right. because it can really fill a bag very quickly when you're trying yeah. to clean out your closet. So and it, you know, just to, to hint back at how much you can save out of your garbage just by following reduce, reuse, recycle. Mm -hmm. You know, in composting that waste hierarchy that we have. If you take those steps one at a time, you'll be finding that you're pulling out the majority of your stuff from your garbage bag, and your garbage bag is going to be much much smaller at the end of the day. Great. Good to hear. Was it my turn anyway, even though no, I asked a million fine. questions? Okay. Um, <laughs> um, um, how would the funds be reimbursed to the, to the residents was number 12. Did we answer that yeah. one? Um, not yet. No. Not yet. How will the funds be the reimbursed? presentation, but I think we want to do it in more layman's terms here. Yes, I understand. And I want that to, would be Steve's job. That would be sure. Steve. Steve, your job. So um, what we're looking at is a, is a prepaid debit card. Yep. So... Uh, what would come to people's door uh, is a debit card that once they went online or call, called the 1-800 number or sent an email or uh, however they wanted to register that card, um, they would activate it and then it's the equivalent of cash. And you can go to any store that accepts a debit card and swipe it and use it to pay for your groceries, your gas, um, whatever it is that you, you might want to buy at that time. Okay, thank you. Um, I just wanted to mention I, I uh, have plan on uh, showing apartment dwellers and people who don't have a whole lot of property on the outside to compost their, uh, uh, their table scraps. It's pretty easy to do. You can do it inside your house. And it does not smell. I do it at my house. Um, how does the use of stickers, and we've had it a number of people who ask us about this, uh, so again, that's a good question. How does the use of stickers on bags compare with the use of special bags in terms of incentivizing recycling? And I think I'll ask Steve or Sarah that question. So the, there are, um, in terms of pay-as-you-throw programs, uh, not specific to more in return, but pay-as-you-throw programs, there are a lot of different ways to do it. You can use a bag, you can use a sticker, you can use a, a hard molded plastic cart that has wheels on it. A lot of different ways to do it. The bag programs are the most effective for a couple of reasons. Um, on a sticker with printing technology being what it is, it's fairly easy for people to make their own stickers. Uh, and then the person who's picking up the waste has to actually stop and look at the sticker and compare the printing of a legal sticker and an illegal sticker. And because their job is to pick thing, the legal bags up and move quickly, it's not something that's often done. So it's easier for people um, to get creative with a sticker program so we've seen a, uh, one city, it was about uh, 50,000 people who went from stickers to bags, saw about a 38% reduction in their waste because people were cutting the stickers in half, people were printing their own stickers, people were putting loose trash in a bin and then a stickered bag on top of it, or bags without stickers and then a stickered bag on top and the waste hauler would see the stickered bag and dump the whole thing. So there's a, there are a variety of ways for people to frustrate a sticker program. We see a substantial reduction of waste uh, and increase in fairness because if somebody's paying for their stickers and somebody else isn't, that's unfair. With plastic bags, you can't cut the bag in half and still use it as a bag. Uh, so it's a much more effective way of getting to the to, to the end of reducing cost and increasing recycling. Did, did you see a, a problem with the varying size of bags also? Great point, yes. Um, so what the, this community saw is some people were using contractor bags. So they'd be using a 50-gallon bag when they're only supposed to be using a 30 or a 33-gallon bag. Uh, and again, that's another level of unfairness that this community worked right. out. Thank you. Now for the big question for anybody. <laughs> How is this different from pay as you throw? The fundamental difference is that uh, the funds that are collected, the net proceeds, um, minus the cost of the bags and the administration of the program, um, will all be returned to the residents. The pay-as-you-throw program, the revenues from the bag sales came to the city treasury, and the city was able to use that as a revenue um, against Property. costs and used it to offset property tax. Okay. Uh, with this program, uh, the revenues will be returned to the residents directly through the debit card. And uh, so the only, the only gain to the city directly is the savings from the avoided tip fees. Uh, so a big revenue difference from the city's perspective on what, what the city will collect. Um, 
the folks who uh, are buying the bags will actually see a net price for the bags of about 25 to 30 cents per bag which is pretty much right on line with what they will end up paying for bags that they're going to buy off the shelf that they buy right now off the shelf for their trash bag program. So these bags are not going to be significantly more expensive on the net to the consumer than what the retail bags are right now, assuming that they recycle at the average rate or better. So basically we're saying, and this is a this is something people have brought up to me, the cost of the actual physical bag is about 25 to 30 cents. It's a good quality bag, similar to probably a Glad or a Hefty bag. And the cost of the trash that you put inside the bag is the dollar seventy to a dollar seventy five. Because people have said to me, I can buy I don't have to pay two dollars for a bag, I can buy a bag for twenty five cents. And I've said, Well, it's not the bag that you're paying for, it's paying it's the trash you put in the bag that you're paying for. And I want to make sure people are very clear. The bags have to be purchased this way because we need to color them and we need to stamp them to make sure they're special. But the cost of the bags is no different from what you're paying in the grocery store. Yeah. It's the cost of what you're putting in the bags that Correct. is is this, it's either more in return or pay as you throw. The cost of what you're putting in the bags yeah. is the true cost. The pay as you throw was intended to pay for the disposal of the, of the material in the bags. The more in return does not pay for that disposal. The more in return simply incentivizes folks because of the initial out-of-pocket cost, incentivizes them to recycle so that, we, so that we actually shipped less tonnage of trash that we pay for at $70.50 a ton. Uh, so the savings and the avoided tip fees are what uh, benefits the, the city and the city's tax base, um, but it's not nearly as dramatic as the page you throw program uh, was in terms of affecting the expenditures. Okay. Thank you. I'm not quite sure how I ended up with this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Uh, why shouldn't the city keep the revenue from the sale of bags and not return it to the, to the residents? That's probably a question for uh, for you to answer, Brad. Uh, <laughs> why I, said, I wonder why I got this question. I don't know how you got that question, and it wasn't set up. Well, rather than but, start but a I'll debate. Have, but but <laughs> let, me, let me just say that in dealing with the Solid Waste Subcommittee. Uh, of the city council. Of the city council. Thank you. Uh, our initial charge was to develop a trash metering program uh, that dealt with the major objection of the of the page throw program, which was the city keeping the revenues, uh, the the, the uh, underhanded tax or a second tax on people's trash. They felt that they were paying their tax base for the trash disposal, and they shouldn't have to pay for that again in the purchasing of the individual bags. It's purely a political decision as far as what's right and what's wrong in that regard. And I think that the uh, when we embarked on this program, it was to try to continue to aggressively reduce what, what, what administratively many of us view as a waste of taxpayers' money to pay to burn trash or bury it in the ground. And if there are ways to reduce that and put that money to a better use, then that was a a moral responsibility and an ethical responsibility that we as administrators and elected officials in the community had to try to deal with. Now, if the folks say they don't want to do that, then that's a community decision that gets made. It's been made, and, and we deal with it. Um, if the city council doesn't feel like that's where it wants to go, that's, again, a policy decision. There is no real right or wrong answer to that question. Mm -hmm. It's just what the needs of the community are and how the community wants to respond to a, a pressing issue and with all the competing demands for prioritizing municipal expenditures and with our limited resources, um, it's just a, another avenue to take to try and find a way to do more with less. It was funny, I was talking to someone today, and the pays you throw more in return are very similar programs except for who gets the money back. It really, it's not much different. But I said to someone today, I mean, would you really want to pay your water, you pay it as a separate bill. Would you really want to pay for your next-door neighbor's water 
constantly running toilet when you know if you fix your toilet you won't have the large water bill that could ensue or their pool in the backyard. It's the same thing with trash. That's why we call it a trash metering program. Do you really want to pay for your neighbor's trash? Do you want to pay for Kennebunk's people's trash, Wells people's trash? We all want to just pay for our trash and taking it out of property tax and paying for it in a different way does that. So. Your question. Huh? Next your question. Your question. I know it's my question. Oh, okay. <laughs> How is this, this is actually a perfect question for me, I think. How is this fair to folks on a fixed income, and especially the elderly population, which um, has been very vocal and, and participated well in these forums? Anyone? You want to try? Sure. So uh, <laughs> the, the program is fair because when you first buy the bags, understanding you're going to get the average amount of revenue back, that represents how much waste you're using. And so for someone who is not someone on a fixed income, may not be generating a whole lot of waste, mm -hmm. um, they will pay less into the program and they will get their rebate will be the average. So the, the, the difference there, paying in less and getting average, is going, to be a, is going to be a net gain for them. And so it's fair because they're getting a rebate based upon their, uh, their, their winning there, the rebate is greater than their expense, because they're doing the right thing and generating less trash. And that's to the benefit of all the taxpayers in the community because that lowers the tipping fee that everybody's paying. Mm -hmm. So when the waste goes from the high wasters and the high recyclers to a place to be disposed of, the community's paying for that. And the people who generate less trash and increase their recycling more are the folks who are benefiting not only themselves, but everybody. Mm -hmm. And so the program's fair because their cash outlay up front only represents their cost. And so if they're generating less and have the ability to use less or recycle more, it's going to let them drive that cost lower and lower and lower and make their rebate more valuable to them. In all fairness, I'd say that's the seniors who've asked for the eight gallon bag because they want a cheaper bag and they know that's all they're going to use in a week. Right. Yeah. So they should make, make any even more from this program yeah. if they and have I an think, eight gallon bag. I think sizes. another way to, to look at that fairness and equity is to consider the fact that right now everybody pays the same percentage, the same percentage of everybody's property tax payment goes towards the solid waste portion of the budget. And so if you use little demand for that service because you're an efficient recycler, your rebate is going to sort of help offset the unfairness of the portion of your property taxes paying for the above average users mm -hmm. of the system. So if people could sort of get a handle on in their own minds how they have been subsidizing folks who throw out large volumes of trash year after year after year in their property tax, I think they'd be less vehement about the idea of make people pay for what they use mm -hmm. because it's it's hidden in your property tax and the average is the same for everybody in terms of what percentage of their property tax goes to um, the solid waste disposal portion of the budget and this rebate sort of reimburses them for some of that inequity. I don't think it reimburses them for all of it but it can be viewed as reimbursing them for, for some of it. And I think d directly to that point and we've heard this for, uh, at some of the forums, um, I think it's important to distinguish the solid waste service from other fundamental public services like p police, fire, and education where I may not have children in the school but I'm still paying for the schools in my property tax. There's a fundamental public good from public education uh, and I, you were the one who made mm -hmm. this point uh, at the forum that a better educated pop community has better economic development, has, um, has a, there are a lot of benefits to it. There are a lot of benefits to me to have a fire department even if I don't call them um, because my neighbor's house doesn't have a problem which then becomes my problem. So there are a lot of public benefits to public services but being able to, for me to generate more trash and have Sarah pay for that isn't a public benefit. As a matter of fact, it's the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. So I think just as Charlie was saying, to be able to break that subsidization isn't like public education or police and fire where we need that because even if I'm not using the service I benefit from it, I don't benefit or Sarah in this instance doesn't benefit <laughs> from my wasteful ways. Yes, yeah, she is the better recycler. We she know is. that, right? Yes. <laughs> uh, we got a couple more quick questions. Uh, is it fair to reimburse the folks who don't live in Sanford year-round, for example, the snowbirds, or people who may have seasonal camps here uh, who uh, would be using the parish to throw but wouldn't be here year-round? 
Um, I think I think this program is based on sort of a law of averaging here. Um, we are not tracking exactly who buys um, what bags, and um, so I think we, if we go to the more in return, um, we have to sort of accept the, the averaging component of it. But I think with regard to seasonal residents, when we do the registration forms, I think we can include in that you know the question about your seasonality of your residences. Most people, most people will answer that honestly in a fairly honest uh, disposition. And if they're six-month residences, then we could code into that uh, database, you know, a 50% return for those folks. And I think that would be fair and equitable. But to be more precise than that, I, I don't think we, I don't think we can do that at this point. Mm -hmm. um, we can, we can explore that with Way Zero and with the subcommittee further to see how far they'd like to try to, to go with that. But I think in concept, what we sort of have felt was the right solution to that was simply to include in the registration the seasonality aspect of, of folks' uh, residency here and, and that at that point trust in the, in the fact that folks are going to be honest. I think for most true snowbirds, too, they're going, A, they're seniors who tend to be extremely honest, and two, I think a lot of them might not have main residency, and so we'll pick up on that in the process, and we might be able to further delve into that and make sure that we're not reimbursing a whole percent, 100 percent, as opposed to 50 percent. Yeah. So. This is one of the issues that has been raised in the forums, Yeah. and, and we haven't gone back with the subcommittee um, to refine the program based on the public input yet. That's mm -hmm. going to happen after um, the final meeting next Monday, ne next Monday yes, week, week from today. Don't um, smile so much, Sarah. <laughs> well, actually, since we don't know when this is going to be shot, the final Excuse form me. is going to be on March 25th, and then the subcommittee, the city council subcommittee will start to process all of these new ideas and concepts. So we think we have a solution to address that issue, but we have not really worked that with the Solid Waste Subcommittee at this point. Great. Okay, Leo, you're going to get involved in this one. Excellent. So, because I know you've been quite quiet over there. How does Eco Maine profit from the recycling, and why can't the city do this without them? Why do we need Eco Maine at all? Excellent. I mean, question. with Leo so charming and all, but. <laughs> So what EcoMain does is it takes all the recyclables, sorts them out, and then sells those bales. And the revenue from those bales go to you know support EcoMain. Um, since we are a nonprofit, those that revenue really goes to just maintain the facilities, pay the staff, and keep the place operational, so that there's a place for all that you know waste you know recyclables to go. There. Is there are certainly towns and municipalities that do process their own recyclables, but there are a few things that EcoMain can do that those individual municipalities on their own can't. Since EcoMain does process about 25% of the population's recyclable materials for the state, that's a larger value or larger volume. So we're able to barter a little bit better with the individual vendors to get you know, a little bit better, you know, places for it to go and and then use, you know, be able to process more material. Also, because it is a market, it's volatile. So it's sometimes it's up and sometimes it's down. Mm -hmm. And by having it set like we do with you know the city where it's just a zero tipping fee you pay nothing regardless of the market so the risk is taken off of the municipality and is borne born by us and we can better you know we can better deal with that risk by having you know the community that ecomain partners with mm -hmm. so when the market's up no, you're not being paid for your recyclables, but when inevitably the market's down, you're not being charged for them either. So it's a constant zero fee that you can expect and count on. And that, and that, was, a, that was an arrangement that was negotiable between the, the city and EcoMaine, and the choice was made by the city not to participate in the risk part of that because we didn't want to have downturns in the economy when we had unbudgeted expenses because what we had thought was going to be a revenue in the recycling market turned into a cost mm -hmm. and then it's a double bite because not only didn't we get the revenue but we had to pay for the disposal of that material and it would be very difficult for us to um, build that into into our budgets um, which start 
generally speaking, mm. our budget process starts in November. So we're, we're, we're seven months or eight months ahead of the fiscal year that we're budgeting for. There's really no way for us to predict what the market for the recyclables is going to be for that next fiscal year. And it just seemed prudent from our perspective to take the risk out and let EcoMain handle it. And we were still bartering for the avoided tip fee on our, on our trash disposal. Charlie, uh, Steve, do you have, this is about the conclusion of this program. Do uh, you have any final thoughts before we conclude and let the mayor make our final yeah, thoughts? I think the only, the only thing that we didn't really discuss quickly was um, the concept of roadside dump, illegal roadside dumping yes. that comes out of uh, a paper bag um, program. And, uh, and we did keep records of the previous program, um, which really indicated that the uh, illegal dumping of uh, rubbish um, really didn't change dramatically when the with the implementation of the page you throw program uh, for a 10 week period before the page you throw program uh, for a 12 week period prior to the implementation of the other program uh, we had 10 cases of roadside trash dumping and for the 16 weeks Following the implementation of that program, we had 15 cases of roadside trash dumping. So there wasn't a marked change in the rate of roadside dumping. What we did find was that uh, of the roadside dumping that we investigated, um, the vast percentage of that trash that was put at the curb, uh, dumped roadside, was from out of town. So we actually go through that trash and look at it. and. Uh, and only five of those instances out of 24 were Sanford residents that were illegally dumping those bags. And the majority of, uh, and then the rest of the trash, the other 19 instances of that um, were from neighboring communities bringing their trash into Sanford and having it disposed of at our taxpayers' cost. Thank you. Pete, I mean, Steve, I keep calling you Pete. You weren't here when I was calling you Pete constantly. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm one of three boys. I answer to pretty much anything. So, okay, um, I think you know, certainly the more in return program is, I think, provides an interesting dynamic for residents to be able to get a rebate. And it is, it is similar to the page throw program, feels similar to the page throw program, except when you get the rebate and realize. Well, this, the city of Sanford actually took pay out of pay as you throw. Yeah. And we think that's a very important, very helpful dynamic that's going that incentivizes the right behavior to avoid buying the bag to begin with. And at the end, I'm one of the people who I think, like several people around here, would keep track of the cost of the bags that I bought. At the end, looking and saying, wow, I actually made money from this. I, did, I really did the right thing. So I think it's a program that has real great potential for the city to provide people a great incentive at the front of the program and certainly a great incentive at the end when the money comes back to be able to spend it in the local economy and to continue to, to grow and develop the city. Okay. Anything, Leo? Nope. Thank you very much Not for having me. Not even the words reduce, reuse, recycle? Please remember to reduce, reuse, recycle, and compost if you can. Yes, I'm going to try that this year, actually. <laughs> well, I want to thank everybody who's watching. Um, I hope this has been informative. Please feel free to, to contact City Hall if you have any further questions. They have all the contact information for everybody at this table. Um, and just remember, <clears throat> the money that we spend in the budget, the expenses um, are all expenses that you as taxpayers share. And we are trying to reduce one line item. We are trying to reduce the amount of trash that we put into the system so that we don't have to pay as much to get rid of trash. And this is the best program that has worked so far for every, for every community who uses it across the country. We saw huge results when we had this program in place in 2010. It saved the, it saved the city. Even if we had given the, the bag money back to the citizens, at the time, the city still saved money not having to pay to dump our trash. It is important we do something in order to reduce our cost. And people keep asking me for, to bring the property taxes down, to bring other costs down, and we have to do programs like this in order to reduce the cost to the community. So please pay attention. The city council will be discussing this extensively in April during our two meetings, April 2nd and April 16th. 16th. So tune in. Uh, we hope this is this has been a great session for you and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you.